Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I want to answer a question which I just kind of thought of, and that is, what other information does a structural engineer need to be a good or even a great engineer? It's really important to understand what other consultants do because everyone plays a part in the team and interacts with the structure and the engineer. Now, obviously I'm not saying that you need to be an expert in that field, I'm just saying that you need to have a decent appreciation of kind of what they do and how they interact with your structure. Just knowing some of the basics can go a really long way into making you a much better team player. So the first one's gonna be probably your closest relation and that's gonna be your drainage and your civil engineers. In my experience in building structures, the structural engineer is probably gonna be the lead engineer, sort of looking after both the structures and the civils. You'll have your sort of civils or drainage guys you know, doing their own part of it, but you will be kind of overseeing all of it, the structures and the civils part. This does vary from project to project, and what I've described is when the structures part is the kind of the larger part of the main project. But if the civils or the drainage side is probably the bigger bit, then the civil engineer will probably be the sort of lead engineer on that project, not the structures. So because the building foundations can be influenced by the drainage solution, it's really important that both the structures and the civil engineers talk to each other to discuss their sort of ideas and their proposals. It's much better to start the design process earlier on together so that you kind of come up with a design which incorporates a good structures and a good civils design. Why it's important for the structure engineer to know some parts of drainage is because, like I said, the structure engineer could be the lead engineer and it's not always that both the structural and the civil engineer will attend the same meeting. Sometimes it's just going to be the structure engineer. So if you don't have any idea on any of the drainage, you know, you're going to look like a bit of an idiot at the meeting if someone asks you because you're representing sort of both disciplines. If you're unable to start the design scheme with a civil engineer next to you, then it's important that you know some of the basics of drainage so that when you do come up and scheme your structures, that you're constantly thinking about how this might impact the drainage. The more you consider of others, the better engineer you'll be. And this is kind of the theme of this video and you know, I'll be talking about other disciplines and how basically you need to know what other people do. So here are a couple of things which you could look out for when designing your structures. For example, knowing if it's gonna be an attenuation tank or a soakaway is gonna be proposed, you know, where is it gonna be placed? How far away from the structure? Is it gonna be influencing your foundations in any way? Also knowing what level the sort of storm and the foul water drainage is gonna be leaving the building. Is it gonna be under the foundation? Is it gonna be over the foundations? Or is it gonna be through the foundations? Whichever way it is, you're gonna need a detail to showcasing how it's gonna be. If it's gonna be through the foundation, you're gonna be making sure that the guys on site need to put a sleeve through the foundations before they pour concrete so that they can put the pipes through. Here are some key drainage concepts or buzzwords which you should know. Um, the first one being attenuation tanks and soakaways. So what these are is basically a way of storing stormwater before they are discharged into the main sewers in a controlled way. Ideally, you want your drainage system to discharge by gravity, so you want to avoid pumps. The reason you want to avoid pumps is because of the sort of extra maintenance you will need, whereas if you just have it purely gravity fed, then there's no real maintenance needed other than just cleaning your sewers every now and again. Permeable paving or permeable tarmac. This is the kind of um, the sort of finishing layer above your soakway or your attenuation tank to allow like stormwater or rainwater just to seep into the ground. A lot of things can be resolved quite easily by just simply talking with the civil engineer and just discussing the problem openly. So even if you're not part of the same team, just picking up the phone or getting in contact with the other consultant is really, really gonna help your project move along. And this will apply to the other consultants which I'm about to move on to. So next we have architects, and these are gonna be your next best friends. You wanna have a really good relationship with the architect because basically they're likely to be the like consultant lead on the building project. Not always, but most commonly they will be. When proposing ideas or scheming a structure, you always wanna have in the back of your mind how it's gonna affect the architecture. If there's something structurally that you want to propose and you think it's going to have a negative impact on the way the um, structure looks or the architecture looks, then you want to discuss this with the architect to, to see whether or not your solution is going to be appropriate or not. Say for example that you want to include a column to support a beam in the middle because it's going to break up the span, 
and it's going to make your structure more effective. But this new column that you want to add is going to be in the middle of the room. Now this is something which you can definitely bring up with the architect. It might be that the architect is absolutely fine with you having the column in there. Or it might be that he's quite hesitant of putting it in, but if you explain the pros and cons, then you can you know, make an informed decision. This is something which you might also want to involve the client, because it's probably going to involve money. Not having the column is going to make the structure more expensive and less efficient, but visually it's going to be worse if you include the column in. So it's kind of going to be weighing up these decisions. And there's no right or wrong answer, you just need to talk to the right people and come up with a decision. You always want to be thinking about others. Remember that you're working in a team, not by yourself. Your actions and decisions will impact others. And you want to be a good team player, even if you know the other consultants aren't in the same company. You, know, you want to have a good, long relationship with these people because engineering is a really small world and you'll likely be working with the same people over and over again, especially if you do a good job anyway. So here are some things which you might want to consider when you're doing a design or asking the architect directly. So the first one is, what is the structural floor zone which you've allowed for? Because knowing this can significantly influence what kind of solution that you bring to the table. Next, are they proposing a flat or a vaulted ceiling? This is quite a common question which I ask on sort of residential projects, but this, to be honest, this can be applicable on loads and loads of different types of projects. A vaulted ceiling, in my opinion, looks a lot nicer, and I think that's the majority consensus that a vaulted ceiling, you know, high ceilings looks really nice. But there are some structural implications when having a vaulted ceiling. It varies between situation to situation, but you know, you might be having to introduce another beam or more structure to support the vaulted ceiling. Next, when you're trying to come up with a concept scheme and you're trying to find places for putting bracing, the stability system in the building, you might find that the architect has put loads and loads of windows on all the elevations and they don't stack up because of, you know, the visual, you know, the visual looks that they want the building to have. But this is a problem when trying to fit your bracing because essentially you want your bracing to stack vertically up through the stories to make it more efficient. Now sometimes you really can't get the bracing to stack vertically up through the stories and that's absolutely fine. But if you, you know, identify it early and talk to the architect and discuss it early enough, you know, before planning goes in, because once planning goes in, it's really hard to change the, the way the building looks. I've collaborated with architects earlier on and they've been the ones to kind of guide me, well not necessarily guide me, but they've said, you know, where do you want your bracing? You know, have I shown enough space for you to put your bracing? And then we'll go through the drawings, the elevations, and then try and just mark out where I think the most ideal bracing needs to go and maybe some other optional areas which would be ideal to put bracing but could be omitted. But it's better on in the sort of early concept stage that you put more bracing in and then take it out later rather than not having enough at the start and then trying to add it in at a much later date. So basically get in early in your concept stage where you want your stability system. When you sketch details, try and add some architectural features to it, add some flair to it. Don't just draw the structure. Even if the architectural detailing you've put in is not even close to what the architect is actually thinking of, it does show the architect that you are thinking about them and trying to think about how your structure fits in with the architecture. It goes a long way by doing this and it makes a far better impression that they think, well, because you are thinking about them, how everything gets put together. You're not working in isolation. You're trying to piece together everything because it's not structures versus architecture, it's a team effort and the architect, the architecture needs to work with the structure and the structure needs to work with the architecture. So some things which you might want to add in your detail sketches is you know, stuff like plasterboard, DPM, DPC, the ceilings, the floor finishes, just something to make, you know, to spice up your details, just to make them look that much nicer. So next, moving on to mechanical and electrical engineers. And the most common thing which I want to know from the m and &E engineers is how big or where are their services going to be going. Basically, I want to know if there's enough room underneath the structure to go through and have their services or does the, their services need to go through the structure? 
So in a lot of school projects which I've done, they're gonna be steel frame with, I don't know, like a concrete floor. And say for instance, in the corridors, long corridors, they're ideal positions to have your m &E services. Now, if there's not enough room between the ceiling and the underside of my structure for the services to go through, then the services will need to go through my steel beams. And that's perfectly fine. You know, there's no harm in putting penetrations through a steel beam. It obviously makes the beams less efficient, but if I know that's gonna happen, then I can allow for it in my design. And by discussing it early with the m and &E engineers, I can see where they're gonna be routing their services so that not every beam in that corridor needs to have penetrations and that can you know, reduce some of the extra plates which I might need to put in or it might reduce the section size which I need to implement to have these penetrations in the steel beams just to accommodate their services. So this could actually be a question which you could ask the architect is, how much of a surface void are you allowing between the ceiling and the structural soffit? Say for instance, you have a residential building, like a block, block of flats basically, and you've proposed a concrete frame structure with a flat slab. A good question to ask is what the service void is between the ceiling, like the false ceiling, and the underside of your concrete slab. And that depth is gonna be the service void. And sometimes if the architect is kind of inexperienced, they don't allow for a big enough service void and that can really screw up the project. So having that knowledge early on and trying to plan for it and saying, maybe it's, they've only planned for 100 mil. And in your experience, you know that the services are likely gonna be maybe 150 to 200 mil. If you have this knowledge prior, you can inform the design team and the architect to say, look, you haven't allowed for enough service void. Can you make it bigger? And if you do this earlier on in concept stage before planning has gone in, this can be a massive benefit to the project. Here are some sort of buzzwords which you might hear and it's kind of useful to know about. The first ones being NVHR and MVHR. Now NVHR is naturally ventilation and heat recycling and MVHR is mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Now I don't necessarily think that you need to know exactly how these things work but what's useful to know is you know if it's an MVHR where it's mechanically vented there's going to be some mechanical kit which you need to know the loadings for where it's going to be placed so that you can design your structure for it another thing which you might hear quite a lot on is air source heat pump now there's not really that much implication to the structure but you hear it quite often and you never know you might want it one day in your own house so next, moving on to acoustics. Now the acoustics is really, really important, especially if say you're designing a block of flats and you don't want sound to sort of transfer through walls or through floors. It's really important as the engineer to know about acoustic detailing so that you can kind of factor in this in your structure and detailing. Sometimes you won't have an acoustician on board in your design team. If say the project is quite small, it's unlikely that they're gonna hire one. If you've had previous experience with acoustic detailing, this is like prime time for you to kind of shine because you can say and bring all this experience to say on the previous project, I did this or I did that to solve this problem. And you're basically just benefiting the whole project with your prior knowledge. This is why it's so important to absorb as much information and knowledge as possible from all your projects because you just never know when you might be called upon to bring up that previous knowledge to help and benefit a new project. So lastly, we've got landscape architects and here are some of the common things which I deal with with landscape architects. The first one being green roofs. Now this could fall with the main architect or it could fall with the landscape architect. It does vary, but it does come up quite a lot because green roofs are becoming more and more common because they look good. Now, as soon as I see green roof, the first thing I wanna be asking the landscape architect or the architect is, is it an extensive green roof or is it an intensive green roof? Now, the reason I need to know why is because an extensive green roof is significantly lighter than an intensive green roof. Extensive green roof is, you know, the buildup is a lot less. It doesn't look as good and it's a bit, bit cheaper. Whereas an intensive green roof is a much, much heavier buildup because it looks a lot better. And clearly the weight is something the structure engineer needs to consider most when designing their structure. And knowing which system they're planning to use is gonna be really, really important. Next, external levels and whether or not retaining walls are gonna be required. 
Something that can be overlooked on a project are retaining walls across the site. It's generally in my experience something which is really really overlooked and probably not caught until the very last minute and then just something is just cobbled together on the drawings and just to say yeah here are some retaining walls. But what you really want to do is find out early what the site levels are or what the proposed site levels are, what is the landscape architect planning to do and are there going to be any significant level changes where you know big steps are which is where retaining walls are going to be you know be put in place. If there are going to be retaining walls then you want to know you know how are the retaining walls clad that could affect design are there going to be any barriers handrails or vehicle barriers can be put in place this can also impact your design of the retaining wall whilst on the topic of retaining walls you will want to design your retaining walls to be drained so that you don't have to design the retaining wall for a water surcharge so in order for the retaining wall to be drained you're going to be wanting to put some weep holes in the stem of the retaining wall because you're implementing weep holes and draining the retaining wall, this needs to be drained into a sewage system. So that's when you're gonna to need to call on your friends, your drainage engineers, to come up with a way of discharging that groundwater. Next, similar to a green roof, if you've got like an external terrace built up on like, I don't know, like a big concrete frame supporting a car park or something, or an undercroft car park or basement, you're gonna to want to know what kind of buildup this is and how it's drained because this is gonna massively impact your structure because the loadings can be really significant. I also mentioned how it needs to be drained because that's gonna be really important. Is it gonna be drained through the slab? And in which case you're gonna have penetrations through the slab and it's really important that you kind of coordinate where these penetrations are because in flat slab design or concrete slab design, penetrations, especially for shear and bending, can be really really significant so knowing this in advance can really help you out. I actually didn't want this video to be too long but I think it's going to be quite a long one uh, and that's just because I had so much to say and how I think it's so important that you absorb loads and loads of information from other consultants because it can really benefit you as a person as an engineer but also benefit future projects. I was also going to include junior technical engineers because they are so closely related to structures you know, foundations, basement retaining walls, but I figured if I include that, that's gonna make the video even longer. So I'll probably do a separate video where I talk about basement design and raft design, and that's probably gonna include a lot about geotechnical engineering and what they kind of do to help us out as well. So if you've enjoyed this video and you wanna see future videos, please remember to like and subscribe, smash that notification bell, and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.